I welcome you all to this webinar on uh, training effectiveness and measuring training effectiveness. My name is Disha and I will be the lead facilitator who will take you through the webinar today. This uh, webinar is brought to you by CHRMP. CHRMP is the acronym for Certified Human Resource Management Professional. Uh, this is a globally recognized certification in the field of human resource and every person who either aspires to be a human resource professional or is already in the field of HR would benefit tremendously by uh, taking this certification. This certification is essentially competency-based, which gets validated by way of the examination conducted in partnership with uh, Pearson View, which you can take it either from the comfort of your homes or uh, through the Pearson View learning test centers about 5,600 of them spread across the globe. We are present in 190 countries and uh, our alumni base is over 10,000 plus now. And this will just give you a snippet of where all our alumni works. This is not to say it's not a very comprehensive list. It is just a glimpse into where the alumni of CHRMP really work. Don't forget to press the like button and leave your comment. Share the video and subscribe to our channel for more HR-related content. To never miss a notification on our latest uploads, make sure you hit the bell icon. Okay, so now let's set the agenda for the webinar. So by the end of the webinar, we'll understand the importance of measuring training effectiveness and what kind of impact does training effectiveness and evaluation of training effectiveness really create on organizational excellence, organizational profits, productivity. So let's begin by checking some of the myths which are associated with trainings and its effectiveness. The first myth is that the best measure of training effectiveness is participants reaction, which essentially means the immediate reaction of the participants is the first or is the best measure of assessing how good or bad our training has been. That's the first myth associated with it. The second is human resource professionals don't need to measure training effectiveness. Why? Because business doesn't want it. This is what the myth is. And we'll see if in the next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, we've been able to bust these myths. The third myth is learning impact is impossible to measure. Really? So let's see. Now, we know for a fact that more and more organizations are focusing on higher productivity, greater performance, greater profits. And all of this, the key factor in all of this is capability building. And when we say capability building, what kind of capability building are we really talking about? We are essentially talking about the human aspect of it, the, the capital, the human capital. So talent development. Now, the moment I say talent development, the question that comes to the mind is, what has been the natural evolution of this field of learning and development? And why do we call it talent development today? So till about a couple of years back, I would say about 10, 12 years back, this entire field was called as training and development. And then about five, six years back, it took the shape where the nomenclature changed to learning and development. Now, more and more organizations are looking at this vertical and calling it as talent development because the focus has shifted to using more of competency-based approach to HR, which is nothing but identifying what behaviors leads to successful outcomes. And these behaviors are obviously characteristics of people. So the focus more and more on calling it as talent. And organizational capability building can be achieved through developing this resource, this particular capital, the human capital, which is the most valuable asset today. More than, you know, probably the capital assets and all the physical assets. It's the human resource capital, which is the most valued asset. So having said that, we know that organizations invest so much on training, but then as the slide says, training is considered to be a necessary evil. Why an evil? Because there's so much of expenditure that really goes, uh, you know, in, in a training function. 
whether it's a one day training or let's say for a spread over a couple of days, there's a lot of expense. It's essential because as part of talent development, it's a must do. It's become, it's recognized as a must do by organizations worldwide. So now the question comes that, what are the kind of expense that organizations really spend on training? When we talk of training, what, what kind of costs are included? So let me move ahead. When we talk about the various costs associated with training, we are talking about salary cost. By salary cost, I mean that for every person who's attending a training, that particular employee is really not doing the task or the job that he or she is supposed to do that particular day. However, he or she is getting paid for it. So it's not a leap. Trainings, when they don't happen over weekends or when it's a holiday, consume weekdays, which is effectively man days of work. So there is a cost attached to it, which is the salary. So you're still paying that salary to your employees for attending a training, but not for doing their work. The productivity loss is what is the loss to the organization when your employee is engaged in an activity which is not really part of the job, which is training. So typically in organizations, the ratio of salary to productivity loss is anywhere between 1.3, so 1 is to 3, to 1 is to 5 also, which means if $1 is paid as salary, then the productivity loss associated with is anywhere between $3 to $5. So it's a huge gap. You know, and it's a huge factor to take into account. Infrastructure cost, we know that, you know, the venue, the cost of additional manpower that you need, you need someone from the admin to manage it, everything. The trainer and the training cost, the most obvious cost associated is when you will be paying it either to the training vendor or to a freelance consultant. So having said that, when there is so much of a cost associated with training, it becomes imperative and more and more organizations these days are on the lookout for finding out that how is this cost getting justified? If I'm spending so much of cost on, let's say whether it's one day of training or spread over a couple of days, am I being able to justify it internally? So as HR professionals, then it becomes one of our responsibilities to assure the management about the expense being used in a just way and how that expense would get recovered over a period of time. Is it a wasted expense or can something really come out of it? So when we talk about this, which means that for every training, there'll be certain key questions which will emerge. Certain key questions which as either we are vendors, training vendors, or we are managing a training function in the department, or we are HR professionals in an organization. So some of these problem statements are, how well did the training intervention really go? Was the training or the learning effective? Do I see changing or some changes on the ground? And what is the possible return on investment for the organization? So we are essentially trying to see, again, as I say, that all the expense that an organization is investing towards developing the talent, is it yielding to some profits? Is it leading to greater productivity? Is it driving performance? And then finally creating organizational excellence. That becomes the basis on which any training needs to get evaluated. Which brings us to the next question that if we need to evaluate training, then what are the most obvious ways? Is there any model on which we can evaluate the effectiveness of training? As HRs, do we have any model which we can use as a linchpin to support our claim that every training that I'm undertaking is definitely yielding good results or is definitely enhancing organizational productiveness. So here, one of the most popular models for measuring training effectiveness or learning effectiveness, as we say, is Kirkpatrick's model. This was developed by uh, Sir Donald Kirkpatrick, and that's why uh, it's named after him. Now, essentially, this model measures training at four levels, L1, L2, L3, L4. And what is expected to be achieved if the training is measured at these specific 
levels is very, very different. Right? So let's begin with an L1. Now, typically, an L1 is the immediate reaction. So let's say a training has been done, the training is concluded, and just before the participants exit the room, the trainer gives a feedback form. And that feedback form essentially captures your first level of reaction, the immediate reaction of participants as soon as they've completed their training. That is the L1. So that's why we say it is the reaction. And this is typically how a L1 feedback form would look like. There'll be a set of criteria. So here, you know, we've got about eight or nine of them and you rate them on a scale. So you rate them on a rating scale or a Likert scale as it is called. And then you take the average of the scores and you decide whether the training has been successful or not successful. Now, one thing that may strike you all is that here the Likert scale or the parameters we've used is just on a four point where Whereas most of us would have taken some kind of or would have filled in some kind of feedback form where it's usually been five pointer rating scale. Now, this is what the difference this particular course brings to you. This is the cutting edge or I would say the leading trend in industry these days. When we use a five point rating scale, then essentially we are subjecting our evaluation to something called as error of central tendency. Which means what? Which means that as a participant, you will play or you will try to play neutral. So the moment you have a third column, right? So from five, four, three, two, one, five being, let's say, the highest and three being the lowest, the tendency would be always to play safe. So the raters or the participants would not show their true inclinations whether they like the training or they did not like the training. Hence, this is we suggest that always use a four pointer rating scale where you can clearly get an indication of whether the participant had a favorable opinion of the training or an unfavorable opinion. However, sometimes it is possible that as an organization or, or as HR, you may not be in a position to roll out a four point rating scale. Even in that case, our recommendation is that you make your third point, which is your central uh, column, at least bent towards one side. So, for example, here it could be very strongly agree, strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. So, the moment you say agree, then which means you're bent, you know, your natural inclination would be to either rate it, if it's agree, you mark it three, then it's towards favorable or it's unfavorable the other way. Also, if we see the L1 form is really giving us immediate reactions about the trainer, the whether the participants liked the training. So a training program has concluded. And the first question is, did my participants enjoy the training? Did they like the training? Did they like the trainer? Did they like you, the overall arrangement that was made was the infrastructure in, was it in place? So that's why if you look at the first three criteria, facilitator had adequate knowledge, facilitator's communication was effective, and facilitator's response to participants were effective. So we are trying to gauge the participant's reaction to the trainer or the facilitator. If you look at the next few statements, it's about, I enjoyed the learning process. The concepts are relevant to my role. Ideas learned will make a difference. And I'm committed to using these ideas. So here we are take, talking more about the training content and the overall training, whether I will be able to apply what I've learned. And the last statement is giving you a general indication of participants' response. So the L1 feedback form gives us reaction to the trainer and to the training as a whole. And whether that particular training has or is relevant to the job role or not, right? So this is what a typical feedback form would look like. If you see on the left side, you've got questions, which is nothing but the criteria which was there in the previous slides. Then you have a four point rating scale. So here we had 24 participants and 
each of them rated on the various uh, parameters or the criteria, and then basis their response, a value was assigned, and we arrived at an average. So we arrived at an average of the specific criteria. Also, we arrived at an overall average of, let's say here, 3.55 out of 4. Now, most organizations. 70% of the organizations who undertake any kind of training interventions stop at L1 level. So L1 is the easiest to administer because it happens right in the classroom or you know in the venue where the training is being conducted. And most and it's easiest, and most organizations organizations hence just stop at that. However, is this the true measure? Does it really measure how effective your training has been. And this is where Kirkpatrick goes on to recommend the various other levels. Now let's look at level two. When we're talking about level two, so level one answers a question that did my participants enjoy the training? Did my participants like the training? So fine, they liked it, but then what? Next what? So if they liked it, did they learn something? So this, the knowledge aspect of it or the learning, learning aspect of a training is what L2 forms try to gauge and evaluate your training, the entire training intervention on. Because liking a program does not mean that it would lead to gaining knowledge. And L2 tries to assess participants' knowledge of the whatever the learning outcomes that was promised at the start of the training program. The question arises that how do we do that? So L1 we do by way of creating a feedback form which we've seen and which we measure on a Likert scale. When we talk about measuring L2, this is done by using a, the most common method of, using, of doing an L2 evaluation is by using a pre and a post self-evaluation test. Now as the name says, pre which means pre-training and post-training and this is self-evaluation. So self-evaluation by whom? Self-evaluation by the rater, self-evaluation by the participants who have undergone a training. How does this work? Now, if you look carefully, we see that we've got five columns, A, B, C, then A to B, and the last one is C to B. When a participant enters the training session, let's say in the morning, the trainer administers this form for the first time to them and the participants have to rate themselves on those defined criteria as A, which means even before the training has started, where do the participants really think they are on the various parameters? Now, where have these questions or these criteria come from? So, here we go back to how any training takes place. Now, any training follows a very, very structured approach. So, initially, there is a need analysis that is done, which means that what are the gaps in my participants in terms of knowledge, skills, or attitudes that this training is seeking to fulfill and bridge the gap. So, when you do a need analysis, on the basis of that, you identify certain learning outcomes, you identify certain objectives that you expect the training to achieve or certain objectives that should be met by the time the training concludes. So the parameters, which is number one, two, three on my left, if I see being aware of my own presentation style, being aware of behavior. So this particular training was conducted on effective presentation styles, how to make presentations effectively. So these were the three criteria set out. There were many more, but just for understanding purposes, we've taken three. So when the trainer comes in for the first time, this form is given to them and the trainer evaluates himself or herself on this even before the training has started. So that is A. Then the trainer takes them through the entire, so the trainee evaluates themselves and then the trainer takes the trainees through the entire session of training. So in this case, a session on how to make effective presentations. So B is essentially after the training concludes, this form is again given to the participants or to the trainees and they are asked to evaluate themselves. 
So let's say in the morning when the participants came in, they probably thought that they, they knew about their presentation style. So they've been doing presentations very often and they know. At the end of the day, after the trainer has taken them through, let's say, the various models, the various tools, the various techniques, the participants may realize that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew in the beginning. So then comes C, which is since the entire criteria is very subjective to the trainees, the trainees are given an opportunity to revise their initial rating of themselves. So in the beginning, A, a participant could either overrate or underrate themselves. C is nothing but giving that opportunity to participant to correct themselves. Would you want to change whatever you thought about your style, your presentation styles in the morning? So would you want to rectify that? And B is the outcome of the training, right? So if we understand A, B, and C, then A to B is nothing but what was the score that a participant achieved after the training minus what he or she rated himself before the training started. So which is nothing but B minus A, right? So A to B means that you subtract the score of B or you subtract the score of A from B and you get that. And when you say C, to be, it's nothing but I thought that I knew a lot in the morning and hence I rated myself on A. However, after the training has concluded, I would like to revise my self rating, right, which was A and I give myself C. So C is what I would like to revise. So which means sometimes the participants may feel that either I knew too much and then they would like to revise their A because they've probably given themselves very low. Or they think that I didn't know much, but I gave myself very high in a particular criteria. And do I want to revise myself after the training? So the training actually has given me a lot more. So this gives us an indication. So when you do a pre and a post, it gives us an indication of how much the participants knew before the training and whether the training has been successful in imparting some knowledge and adding to their overall knowledge. Now, here, the thing to remember is the wider the gap between A to B, the score, the larger the score of A to B on various parameters, which really means on those criteria, your training has been more successful. The lesser the score, which means either we were not able to assess the right criteria for giving the training or probably we were not able to do a good job of delivering the training on that criteria. So for both A to B and C to B, the, the larger the score from the initial rating, the more successful the training has been, the more effective the training has been. So L2 measures the change in knowledge or the change in learning, right? And we do this by going back to our initial learning objectives, which we had set in the beginning of the training and making those objectives as criteria, right? Also, a lot of times what happens is the facilitators may tend to deviate from their session. So this pre and a post document or a form helps the trainer to be, you know, to keep on track that these are the key learning outcomes that I have to achieve before I conclude my session or before I conclude my training intervention. So the trainer tends to, you know, if, if at all he or she goes out of track, it gives an opportunity to the trainer also to come back and track. So both of the objectives are met of ensuring that there is a change in knowledge and also ensuring that the trainer delivers what he or she promised to deliver at the start of the training. And this is just how a training report. So after you've collected the pre and post assessment, and usually like a feedback form, the pre and post assessment is also conducted in the venue before the final conclusion happens. So before everyone exits, you take the pre and post also. Now here, if we see, we can make certain deductions from it. We can actually it's very significant in the sense we are able to assess a lot of scores. Now, if you see our pink line, 
is the pre-training graph of the various participants. So the horizontal axis is P1, P2, P3, P24, which is our participants. The vertical axis is the score, right? Now it says that pre-training, this is what all my participants so cumulatively felt. Post-training, this was the change. So the blue one is the post-training graph and the yellow is the revised pre-training. So do my participants and we see that for a lot of participants, right? Let's say participant uh, three, the revised pre-training is actually much lower than the initial pre-training, if we see. And then we see, so we are able to use that to see what has been the change in knowledge of the various participants. So we can do it participants-wise. We can also do it criteria-wise. So here we had, as I said, we had 14 criteria. We just picked up three. Uh, you know, I just picked up three so that we could understand. But if you had to represent these 14 criteria and whether what was the change criteria wise, that we could also plot them in a graph. So here again, our horizontal axis represents the criteria, vertical axis is the score. So the cumulative scores of all the participants on the various criteria. So on C1, all my 24 participants rated this pre training. Then Device pre-training, which is again uh, the yellow graph or the yellow line going, and the post-training. So, by just by administering the pre and a post self-evaluation form, we are in a position to understand participant-wise how my training has been effective. Also, criteria-wise, which particular criteria? Let's say I wish to repeat this with another set of participants after six months, another sample group. Now. As, as the head HR or as an L&D professional or as a management, if I feel that there are certain criteria which is not showing a remarkable progress, then I may want to question why. Was, did I didn't do my training needs analysis right in the first place that I identified this criteria where the change has not been significant? Or was I not able to deliver the right training for that particular criteria? So it gives me pretty much a detailed analysis right and this particular data was really not possible for us when we just looked at an l1 form and l1 form just gave us a first level reaction so it didn't help us to drill down either participant wise or criteria wise which finally becomes a key on which you measure your training effectiveness another thing that emerges out of my pre and a post is I may want to look at what has been the overall, the total movement of my participants across the various criteria. So all participants, all criteria. And here we see again the pink uh, bar, which is pre training, yellow revised pre training, and post training. Which means looking at this, can I actually conclude that there wasn't too much of gap between my pre training and my post training? But how the candidates really scored themselves on revised pre-training was much higher. So then as an HR professional, I may want to rethink next time, do I want to do this train training or do I want to make changes? So when I'm going back to my training vendor, what changes would I suggest? Because this is clearly showing that the participants, when they give themselves a revised score, they really thought that they knew a lot more than what the training actually gave them. Hence, so much of a difference between the yellow and the blue bars. All right, so we've seen the initial reaction by way of L1. We've seen the change in knowledge or the change in learning by way of L2. However, Having the knowledge, does it always translate into a change in behavior? Because organizations are finally interested in, if I'm sending my employees for a training, what is it that they bring back on the table? Is there any visible change in the behavior which is finally impacting the result? So here, L3 level of feedback or L3 level of uh, measuring actually uh, effectiveness comes into picture which is, so my participants like the training 
at an L2 level, they gained some knowledge. L3 sees that had they been able to transfer that knowledge to an actual behavior in their workplace. So gaining the knowledge doesn't mean that they will be applying that. So at an L3 level, we are checking the application of whatever they learned in the training intervention session. So hence, L3 uh, tracks the change in behavior of my various participants. It tracks the application of whatever I learned to my real working situations so as to impact some results, right? So are they using the competencies that they've learned this is what, at an L3 level, uh, Kirkpatrick suggests organizations would be testing. And we'll talk a lot more about L3 and how difficult it is to measure L3. So, you know, as we as these skills become more and more abstract, more and softer, it becomes more and more difficult to measure your effectiveness, you know, as we go higher up from L1 to L3. Let's say for a software engineer or or let's say for coding if you're doing it's very easy to measure l1 l2 l3 but if you talk about leadership if you talk about communication we talk about team building then how do you measure so the softer your skills become on which you're getting trained the more difficult it becomes to really measure the training effectiveness at an l2 l3 and an l4 level and we'll see this is where this is where we have a tool which really comes handy, which, you know, comes to the rescue of all HR professionals. So before that, before I take you to the tool, a couple of things that, you know, uh, trainers can do is, so you conduct the session, you've taken an L2 feedback form, and now you want to see whether it has resulted in any change in behavior. So one is when you do reinforcement workshops. What is a reinforcement workshop? A reinforcement workshop is you give a training and about 45 after about 45 to 90 days you get the same group of people back and you check with them whether they've been able to apply everything that they learn so you're trying to reinforce their learning the other way of doing it is you know by doing workshops in a staggered way so let's say you or you've been uh, you know, asked to do a five-day workshop on communication skills by a company or a training vendor. Now, instead of doing all five days together, you use a staggered approach. So you do one day of training and then you leave your participants with some projects, some case studies, something that they can use to apply whatever they learn, say for about a week, 10 days, 15 days. Or maybe you do it once a month. So once a month you do you know, one module of that communication skills training, then you give them with a case study, you give them something that they go back to apply or a project where they work together. Second month, you come back, you check whether that application has happened. You teach them or you take them through the second module. Again, leave them with something to test, to apply that. Again, come the third month. So you are basically training on five modules in a staggered manner over a period of time every time checking. However, there are certain inherent flaws if you were to use this method, right? Because every time we are calling our people back into a training room, which means think of all the costs associated with the training. I again will have to pay to the trainer. There will still be a cost of infrastructure. Every time I get my participants to be a part of that training, then I'm taking away their mandates which they could have used effectively. So a lot of costs implication for the organization every time I do this. So after I take you through the L4, we'll talk about there is one particular tool, which is a cutting edge tool and how that really can help us in gauging the change in behavior or engaging whether our participants are really applying without really getting them back in a physical training room. Okay. Before that, let's move to L4. So what does L4 seek to evaluate your training on? So L4 says that 
okay there has been a change in the behavior so my participants have gone back and they are applying but then is that change resulting in some change or is that change impacting some business metric right which means for example i will take an example of a sales person now suppose the key problem area was that most of my sales people are not able to close a deal because they are not able to negotiate better they are not able to convince the clients better and negotiate for a good pricing hence most of the deals are non profitable so at an l1 level you will just check, uh, check the reaction at an l2 level you will check after attending the training sessions have my participants gained knowledge about what are the various techniques they can use in negotiations what are some of the principles key principles of you know let's say convincing that they need to check so you check a pre you do a pre and a post at an l3 level you check whether they are actually applying all those tenets that they had learned so they understood but are they applying all those principles of negotiations and convincing in their work area at an l4 level you will check again you will go back to your first problem statement which is that the deals are getting closed at probably zero margins or very low margins the deals are not profitable because of their lack of negotiation skills so then you see that after undergoing this training after applying all that now are my sales people able to close deals which are more profitable are they able to negotiate with the clients or the customers in a better way are they able to let's say convince clients so are they able to get competition clients to it so which means there is a business case associated with that training and if that training helping us to really address that business case and how do you address it it's by some metric because in the absence of a metric that is why i said that the softer your skills become the more difficult so for leadership how can you define a metric if you cannot define a metric how can you really assess the impact of leadership on the result so when we talk about results we are essentially talking about some index so various indices that you can use there is metrics that you can you, uh, you can use and how training is really impacting on that right so this is what we are saying did the job performance really improve as a result of the training so a job performance is there was certain pain area which i had identified has that been addressed finally because a business owner really would not be so interested in in an l1 and an l2 even in an l3 sometimes they are just concerned that this was a particular pain area or a problem area that identified and has that been resolved so this is what kirk patrick recommended at an l4 level now we've seen the various levels and now let's look at it as i said that one of the myths we talked about was that it is impossible to measure the training effectiveness and this is what we are saying here that inability to measure real impact of learning interventions is the top concern of the organizations and why because as i mentioned 7 out of 10 organizations usually stop at an l1 level so they will just take the reaction and they believe that if my participants have enjoyed the training has been successful assumption being if they've enjoyed they've also learned and it will translate into actions however there is always a knowing and a doing gap so what you know does not translate into doing that so and that's because as hrs or as organizations we do not deploy the a uh, measurement or the evaluation techniques in the right spirit we don't know which level of evaluation should we go for so inability to measure the real impact becomes a challenge and this is what the and as i was as i've already spoken that this is what the flaw or the inherent drawback of l1 and l2 one is it is carried by a trainer right there but we do not know whether it will lead to an actual result also typically in let's say soft skill trainings right so if i'm talking about uh, team building 
or if I'm talking about personality traits, most of the trainers, and I would say, yeah, majority of the trainers are themselves very good people managers. They are very adept at communications. They are very adept at conversational skills. They are very adept in striking a rapport. So it could happen that while your participants have given you a good L1 feedback, it is not reflecting because just because you like the trainer, you will tend to be either neutral or you will be more bent towards the positive side of giving the feedback. But as an organization, I may not be interested in that. I'm only interested in, is it leading to any change in the behavior in people? And which finally, is it impacting the net results? Is it helping me generate better profits? Is it leading to better performance? So this is what I'm saying, right? So we say here that inability to provide a system to participants to convert learning into actual action leads to increasing gap between what you know and what you do. So the knowing doing gap increases widely essentially because we are not using the right mechanism for checking effectiveness or for evaluating the effectiveness of our training programs or training interventions. Okay. So the next question, the most logical question is then how can we measure the real impact of learning in the workplace? Right? And and ensure that whatever we've learned, we are able to apply that. So we are able to transfer our classroom learning to the actual workplace and gain something out of it, right? And this is where, uh, and I mentioned that while talking about L3, that I'll take you through a tool which is really unique, which is the first of its kind in giving the organizations that particular uh, you know, yardstick on which they can measure the change in behavior. And this tool is Results Lab, which is uh, developed by Ripple Learning. It's an in-house proprietary tool that we've developed by studying thousands of organizations and seeing that what is it that they want to check for. So it's an online tool. It's based on uh, a SAS model and really checks or helps to bridge that knowing doing gap that we talked about in the previous slide. So it's checking the change in the behavior post the learning. So this results lab helps the organization to measure effectiveness of the learning interventions at the third level, at an L3 level, which is change in behavior. Uh, you may want to visit the website, which is uh, www.resultslab.in and see how exactly this functions. The basic principle behind results lab is experiential learning, which is nothing but applying Kolb's principle. So there is a problem. You've identified a problem. You've learned ways. So if you understand theoretically how to solve it, then you go back. So you apply that. And then once you've applied, there'll be certain conclusions. You will be reflecting on what went right, what did not go right when once you apply and this whole cycle actually repeats cell cell. So uh, you may want to just Google a little more on what is the Coles model, but it's essentially talking about learning something or forming some concepts, which is what your change in knowledge is, some concepts that that particular training will give you. You will apply those concepts. Once you apply, you will experience certain things, which is active experimentation, because of active experimentation, you'll have some experience, which is concrete experience. And you may want to start reflecting that, was this experience positive, negative? Did I apply it rightly? If not, then what did I miss out? So again, you observe, you reflect on it. And on the basis of that, you form fresh concepts. This is the whole idea behind it. And Results Lab uses this particular, which is today experiential learning is the buzzword. And Results Lab has been actually very successful in applying this whole concept of experiential learning 
to track the change in behavior, to track the application of all that conceptual knowledge that we learn and see whether it's leading to any outcome. And here when we talk about it, this is how Results Lab really works. So if you see from left to right, so there is a training program which has been conducted. It could be on any topic. As a result of which certain ideas, certain concepts emerge. Now, these concepts and ideas need to be tested, need to be applied in real life work situations. So this is what it is. Participants go back, apply. So an element of social learning comes in because, and as we go ahead, we'll see why is it social learning? Because every participant gets to know how my co-participant is applying that. Is it leading to any success? And you learn. So a lot of element of social learning. And social learning is really what everyone is looking for these days. So you apply. On the basis of that, you are able to generate. So Result Lab generates lots of reports for you, which could be participant-wise, criteria-wise, depending on whether an outcome has been achieved. And then on the basis of that, as a management, or let's say if you're part of the top management or you're the HR manager, you may want to redesign, whether you would like to redesign your training intervention, whether you would like to make changes in your design, whether there's a TNA, you would want to do it again. So this gives you really, really very, very robust data. It is not just based on some assumption. It is based on real life application and you're hearing it from the participants themselves who are applying it. So what are the various things that we can do either as HR managers or as training consultants or vendors by using Results Lab? So it provides an interface. So which means that if I have given a training, let's say on communication skills, then that becomes an event for me. And I can frame a lot of questions within that event to really test my participants' application of all that they learned in my training program. So I'm able to track on a very regular basis whether they are applying or whether there is any change in their behavior, any change in the way they're approaching the problem in the first place. It captures the action responses so you exactly know what are the participants doing, whether they're applying it, it gets captured. And here, because it's a common platform where everyone who was part of the training intervention, they come together, the trainer who was there comes together. Even for that matter, you can make someone very high up in the management, in the HR vertical, you know, an admin in, in that particular results lab account. So it leads to, uh, it creates an environment of social learning where positive reinforcements are happening. So every participant is getting motivated by a peer who's applying a tenant and that has yielded some positive thing. So otherwise, in the absence of this, there is a vacuum. And as a participant, I think we also get into this comfort zone where we said we've attended the training, we've liked it, I've gained knowledge and that's enough. But I never get a chance to apply and to test whether I'm applying. Here, the moment I see other participants doing it, I am, I think, motivated to apply that. And it creates that platform where the learning gets shared. And as I said, social learning, because everyone's coming together, it generates powerful reports and we'll see some of the reports that it helps us to analyze and present it to our the management. It creates organizational memory because now everything is documented. You have a tool where you can just pull out reports. So if an organization is investing in trainings regularly on maybe the same kind of training for different batches, it's easier to see the changes, it's easier to see the improvements in the participants over a period of time or the various teams because it creates a storehouse of information for the organization. And by involving line managers, I mean that it will help to create an ecosystem where the managers will be able to see. So we are not banking on the subjective feedback of a manager to say whether that particular participant in the team is applying or whether that training has been successful. When the participants themselves write that what is the change they've seen, 
and the managers are vetting it. It's getting vetted by someone senior and you have your trainer or the facilitator who is coaching you all the time in that. So then it leads to a greater accountability on the part of the managers and the various stakeholders also. You can share files, pictures. Sometimes you may not want, so there could be some very, very sensitive aspects where you may not want to share it openly with all participants. So as an administrator, you have the freedom to create private events where it is not visible. So the inputs shared by participants is not visible to each other. You have that possibility. And obviously, the participants get a notification every time, you know, a co-participant or a peer, you know, uses this tool or has applied something and is reporting that application. So, so this is typically how it will work, right? That a participant would uh, be a part of a training intervention program. Then after the training has concluded and this results lab gets initiated or it gets, you know, so the way all the participants get uh, login credentials. And we see that typically 45 to 90 days is when good habits get formed, any habits for that matter. So this particular tool is active for about 45 to 90 days. Of course, organizations have the flexibility to come back to us asking for an extension of this. And then they log in, every participant logs in on a very regular basis. They share their application of the various concepts, knowledge, techniques, principles. Then you have a facilitator. Now here by facilitator, it means probably the trainer, the trainer who was part of the training session can become a part of this entire ecosystem. So if a participant feels so, the reactions could be there could be a positive reaction, which means the participant applied that particular principle and it yielded some result. So here, it is the trainer's responsibility to kind of give constructive feedback, to motivate. If the uh, response is neutral, then you may want, as a trainer, you may want to coach that participant how to apply the techniques better. If the response is negative, which means as a trainer, I may want to check, is the participant really applying the technique correctly? So can I suggest some corrective actions? Can I suggest some remedial measures to that participant to ensure that the application is fine? And of course, whether the results are met or not is different. So the moment there is an application of what we learn and it leads to some positive outcome for the organization. The organization has achieved something at an L4 level. L4 is, it has created an outcome. It has impacted the result. So again, if I go back to my example of a salesperson, so here the salesperson learns all the techniques of negotiation. So there's a training on negotiation skills, learns the techniques, goes back, starts applying it in the deliberations and interactions with the customer. And let's say after 30, 35 days, the particular salesperson in question is able to clinch a deal, which otherwise, uh, initially the, the customer was like either averse to giving or was giving at low margins. So because of applying, because the person applied those skills which he or she learned, he, was able, he or she was able to convert a not so profitable deal into a profitable deal. So that profitable deal actually is a result. So we see a clear connection between the training intervention and having gone through L1, L2, L3 and the final outcome, which is L4. So it is possible to connect these dots by using this results lab tool. And so after your 90 days, 45 days, for whatever period you want this tool to be active, then a comprehensive get report gets generated, which is shared by the uh, HR professionals with the management. Now, this is a typical example of how any participant would actually give inputs. So if we see, this is following a star format. A star is S-T-A-I, a C-A-R, situation, task, action, and result. Now, a star is 
is actually the most important tool we check for in behavior event interviewing, which is again one of the cutting edge practices in interviewing and which is part of this the course that I'll be talking about. So by using the STAR technique, the participant actually gives their input. So here, for example, Sayyid talks about that meeting with the video quality team for a discussion on integration support of a feature in front. So this was the situation. What was the task? The guy who developed the feature is leaving and will not be available for comments during integration at front end. Ensure to get as much information possible so that we can integrate the support in front end easily. What was the action that Sayed took? During the discussion, I kept on making a list of to-do items. Post discussion, I volunteered to summarize the action items to ensure that everyone was on the same page. So this was some concrete action because Sayed underwent a training which was about summarizing, which was about paraphrasing. He's applying that, that particular concept here. What was the result? Though I haven't integrated the feature yet in front end, but I'm confident and very clear on what needs to be done. Summarizing the points gave me an added confidence and hopefully I will be able to integrate the feature with ease. So in the initial, before the training start, which means that these were not the skills which Sayad and the entire team were equipped with, pose that he's sharing his user experience. And he's saying that even though it has not led to a concrete result, but his confidence has improved as a result of which in future applications, every time he applies this concept in future, he's sure that he will be able to, let's say, integrate this feature. Now here you see there is a comment by someone from Ripple's Learning, Abhishek. So he was the trainer, he was the coach. So here again, the key role of the trainer is being highlighted by saying that good going and you know hope you integrate, right? So here you could also have a manager giving a comment that we are very happy with the way Syed has progressed in his confidence level, right? So what we are saying is all your action responses are essentially based on certain key competencies or skill which we had initially identified as part of our training needs analysis. And results lab really helps us to collect data, real-time data on this while it is getting uh, addressed, while the principles are getting applied, right? So how does Results Lab really help organizations? And these are some of the reports that you see. The first thing is Results Lab helps the organization to actively listen to the participants, which means what? That my participants underwent a training. Now, as part of the management or as part of the HR, I'm listening to where they are applying. I'm listening to whether they have been able to apply successfully, not apply successfully. So it's helping me to understand my participants and pay attention to their voice, right? It's helping my participants to engage because it's providing a platform for everyone who was part of that training. So it provides a common platform where everyone comes there. Your trainer is also there. Someone from the management is also there. And everyone is actively engaging. So if you see the, the right, uh, the, the leftmost donor talks about the cumulative experience of all the participants. It says 98% of my participants had a positive experience when they underwent this training and when they started applying. And participation is about 94.5%, right? So this is an example of how constantly you have a coach who will give you constructive feedback, who will correct you, who will suggest remedial actions, or who will generally just motivate you. So everyone collaborates and social learning takes place here. As a manager, it helps you to analyze the data. Why? Let's look at this example. So the topic was clarity in communications, right? Were you able to summarize after a work meeting to create a gist of points discussed? So here we're talking about summarizing as a key principle of effective communication. And we see that 100% of my participants, right, say uh, 
they had a good experience when they applied and about 88.9% of my participants probably had a favorable experience when they applied similarly we are able to look at all the various parameters right so all the various questions i talked about when you initiate results lab you create an event which is nothing but your training that you underwent and then you write down a lot of questions on which you want your participants to respond to on a regular basis and these questions are based on everything that they learn so here we see question wise we are able to drill down the applicability of uh the principles participants wise and applicability of those principles question wise so it's like every criteria is getting answered and evaluated and it helps us to really give a good drill down right for our future actions okay so this is uh, another way so comment and like as i said it could be a manager it could be a co participant so here a co participant is writing that it's you know it's been a month since and the time is really flying we are, we are eager to see what has been your experience and learning from the module please start sharing your thoughts so it could be a coach who's writing a trainer or it could be someone from the hr it could be your line manager saying that you know you've underwent a training now please start applying it and let's see the results it helps us to optimize why because we can really decide on as i said this helps us to generate historical data and by generating historical data we are in a position to optimize our training interventions in future which means which of those training interventions do i want to do it again so i want to replicate even with that even within that training intervention which are those parameters which actually the participants feel the application was good they learned a lot so as either a training vendor or an as a as an hr manager or an lnd professional it helps us to opt optimize our training intervention in a much much better way for future use right so now the question is if you are part of the hr or as a, as an hr professional now the real question to ask each one of us right so internally uh, the question that each one of us should be asking that am i updated on the latest trends that's happening in the field of hr because just look at this training effectiveness seemingly everyone seems to know what training effectiveness is but as i said 70% of the organizations stop at at an l1 level and even less a number of organizations actually do an l2 and l3 very very few because it is they don't know the tools available they don't know the techniques available you know and the latest trends so they don't know really what to use so that they have effective data on on the basis of which they can take future decisions but as hr professionals if you know that you have these tools available to you or available at your disposal let's say in the case of training effectiveness one is you can become a part of the strategic decision making when you are not just about when you are not into just aligning the training programs but you are also someone who can measure the effectiveness and go back with reports then you become part of that team which is taking decisions if you are part of that team you are in a better position to negotiate better training budgets also you are in a position to rethink optimize think of new training interventions think of all the cutting edge trainings that your teams need because we talked about building organizational capability which comes from talent development but just providing training is not enough we we should be in a position to link all the various dots together so starting from needs analysis to ensuring that it is successful and being able to generate a report which talks about the success so being updated about the latest trends latest cutting edge practices right i talked about 
the using the four point rating scale now most organizations actually use a five point rating scale which has an inherent rater bias so there is an inherent error of central tendency in that so the cutting edge practices start using a four point rating scale so it's about as an hr professional as an ld and d professional getting yourself completely completely updated about the latest trends and currents to learn more on managing absenteeism subscribe to cpd membership by clicking on the i icon above